Okay, thank you. Good evening. Uh, welcome to the February 16th, 2023 meeting of the Planning Commission of the City of Santa Cruz. I'm Vice Chair Julie Conway standing in for Chair Pete Kennedy for this meeting and um, welcome. And welcome to everybody. Um, I'd like to start with a call to order and a roll call. Commissioner Dawson. Here. Gordon. Here. <laughs> Sorry. Kennedy? Here. Maxwell? Here. Lacidi Miller? Here. Paul Hamas? Here. And Vice Chair Conway? Here. Thank you. First of all, do we have any statements of disqualification for tonight's meeting? Seeing none. I'll move on to um, oral communications. This is the portion of the meeting that the public is invited to address the commission on items that are not on tonight's agenda, but that are within the purview of the commission. Um, is there any anybody who would like to um, speak to the commission? Um, please raise your hand and uh, the clerk will identify you. I'm going to give it just one sec for the delay. I don't see anyone raising their hand. Okay, thank you. Seeing none, we will move on to the approval of the minutes of the February 2nd, 2023 meeting. Um, is there any discussion or a motion to approve? Commissioner Dawson? Yeah, I just um, moved to approve the minutes. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you. Could we have a roll call vote, please? Commissioner Dawson? Aye. Gordon? Aye. Kennedy? Aye. Maxwell? Aye. Lacidi Miller? Aye. Will Hamas? Aye. Conway? Aye. That motion is approved. Um, so we'll move on. We have a public hearing this evening. Um, the public hearing is for 915, 917, 919, 923 Water Street and 109 Stanford Avenue. That's CP 22-0092, um, an application for a special use permit, a design permit, non-residential demolition authorization permit, a residential demolition authorization permit, a lot line adjustment and heritage tree removal permit to combine three lots. And hang on, I just had a little, a little blip here. Um, to demolish an existing commercial and residential buildings, construct a four story, approximately 74,000 290 square foot mixed use building with 1,079 square feet of commercial space and 105 single room occupancy units, SROs, on a site located within the community commercial zone district and on land situated within the east side business improvement area plan. And do we have a staff report? Good evening, Chair and members of the Planning Commission. Uh, my name is Tim Mayer, Senior Planner with the City. As mentioned, this evening's first agenda item is a proposed redevelopment of three adjacent parcels at the addresses uh, 915, 917, 919, and 923 Water Street and 109 Stanford Avenue. And for simplicity, the address of 915 Water Street is used in reference to the project. And uh, please note that we unfortunately experienced some technical difficulties right before tonight's hearing and um, uh, Principal Planner Samantha Hashert will be uh, presenting the presentation as I deliver the audio. And um, um, can I just check that the slides are um, visible to the commission? Okay. 
I'm sorry. I'm, I'm also having some technical difficulties here, but if you need one second, I think I've got it. Can you guys see that? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it looks good to me. Great. Great. Okay. Um, let's see. We'll check. I actually don't see the slides, but um, Sam, we're on to the second slide at this point. So, okay. I'm on the project overview. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay, so uh, the project applicant requests approval of several project entitlements, including a special use permit, design permit, non-residential demolition authorization permit, residential demolition authorization permit, lot line adjustment, and heritage tree removal permit. Uh, the proposed project includes um, the combination of three lots, the demolition of the three existing commercial buildings and one residential building, and the construction of a four-story, approximately 74,290 square foot mixed-use building with 1,079 square feet of commercial space and 105 single room occupancy or SRO units on a site located within the CC or community commercial zone district and on land situated within the east side business area improvement plan. Uh, next slide, please. Um, show We're me. on the project site? Uh, yeah, there should yep. be a, an image of the, the project site. So shown on this slide is a subject site bordered in red the site is an approximately 25,384 square foot or 0.58 acre quadrilateral area containing three adjacent parcels situated at the southwest corner of Water Street and Stanford Avenue on the city's east side. The site is bounded by single family residences to the north and elementary school to the south across Water Street and commercial destinations to both the east and west. And surrounding land uses include retail along Water Street as well as residential neighborhoods. Uh, public facilities, El Portal Park, and multifamily development further beyond. Uh, next slide, please. And this slide um, should illustrate um, the three adjacent parcels that are proposed to be uh, combined as part of the project. And next slide, please. Okay, the project site has a general plan land use designation of MXHD, which is mixed use high density, and is located, as mentioned, in the CC zone district. Um, the site is found on land in the city's east side business area improvement plan. And the city's general plan states that the typical commercial uses are similar to those in the CM or community commercial designation, and pedestrian oriented commercial uses are encouraged on the ground floor. The CC zone designation, as stated in the municipal code, serves to provide locations throughout the community to encourage a harmonious mixture of a wide variety of commercial and residential activities. And the Eastside Business Area Improvement Plan states that it provides an approach that integrates economic development with a vision for creating a distinctive commercial environment and provides specific guidelines to help improve commercial vitality by identifying potential improvement for urban planning, streetscape, traffic circulation, and building facades. And it's worth mentioning that the subject site has been the subject of code compliance activity for approximately 15 years, um, up until the last couple of years. The city's code compliance division has worked with a property, the former property owner at the time, over a period of over a decade and a half, attempting to address numerous code violations related to the storage of abandoned vehicles, overgrowth of weeds and accumulation of vehicle parts, wood, paper, plastic, and assorted debris, and so on, which constituted both a fire hazard and a public nuisance. And eventually in 2020, the site was placed in receivership and site cleanup took place in 2020 and 2021. In 2021, the current property owner uh, purchased the three subject parcels, as well as the two adjacent residentially zoned parcels to the north with the intention of redeveloping all of the lots. Uh, to date, 
the staff has received an application only for development of the three commercially zoned parcels, which are the subject of this evening's hearing. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so this slide uh, shows a photo of the project site taken standing across Water Street south of the project site. And visible here are the two um, existing commercial buildings, two of the three existing commercial buildings, and the existing single family dwelling uh, located between. All buildings are currently vacant and in various states of disrepair. The next slide, please. This slide contains a photo of the site as it appears along its easterly side. In the foreground is Stanford Avenue. And two of the existing commercial buildings are shown here, along with the undeveloped land, which makes up part of the parcels in the right hand part of the slide. Uh, next slide, please. This slide shows a former glass shop at the southeasterly corner of the parcel, which is currently unoccupied. The condition of the building, including the damage to the existing roof, is visible here. And a chain link fence secures the site as seen in the photos. Um, next slide, please. This slide shows a photo of a closer view of uh, the whole of one and part of the other commercial building fronting onto Stanford Avenue. And again, the poor condition of the existing buildings is again evident in this slide. Uh, next slide, please. The project proposal was initially submitted for city review on May 25th of 2022. Uh, Pre-application, uh, project number CP210191 was submitted for the project and was subsequently deemed complete pursuant to the Housing Accountability Act. On September 7th, 2022, consistent with the city's policy for public outreach, a meeting of uh, the community was held to gather input from members of the public. Approximately 37 members of the community attended and provided a range of feedback related to expected impacts and modifications of the project site and the neighborhood uh, effects anticipated to result from the project. Uh, participants voiced both support and concern. Uh, some of the concerns that were expressed were the expectation for loss of available on-street parking, as well as uh, reservations about the possible increase in vehicular traffic to the area. Uh, some participants asked about the types of tenants expected to occupy the single room occupancy units. Uh, staff and the applicant noted that the units would not be limited to the number by number to the uh, residents or by age of occupant. And aside from the 14 units required to be provided at the very low income level, um, tenancy would not be restricted to occupants of any particular income level. Um, other questions related to required street and sidewalk improvements were raised and consistency of the proposal to the general plan and zoning designations, uh, as well as state density bonus law. Staff explained the requirements and allowance of state density bonus law and how it provides a mechanism uh, to the applicant to request variations from standard code requirements. And eventually on October 13th of 2022, a formal application was submitted and again is the subject of review of this planning commission public hearing. Uh, next slide, please. The project applicant application has been submitted pursuant to Senate Bill SB 330, which seeks to streamline the review and entitlement of housing projects, including those which include affordable units. Um, SB 330 modifies the Housing Accountability Act and the Permit Streamlining Act and adopts the Housing Crisis Act of 2019. Um, the, the bill defines housing development to include, among other types of projects, uh, mixed use projects with minimally two thirds of their square footage dedicated to residential units, as is the case of the uh, present application. As a mixed use project with greater than two thirds of the square footage dedicated to residential use, the application is eligible for the provisions of SB 330. Um, SB 330, among other regulations, reduces the time frame for approval or disapproval of a project to 60 days and less with the applicant and the regulatory agency mutually agree to an extension of this time period. Um, and importantly, under SB 330, the project application is subject to only those ordinances and policies in place at the time uh, that the project got pre-application is deemed complete. And because the pre-application was deemed complete in July of 2022, prior to adoption of the city's recently adopted objective standards, um, compliance with those objective standards is, is not required for this project. Um, SB 330 requires that the Planning Commission make a decision to approve or disapprove the project unless the project is found to hold a specific adverse impact on public health or safety and that no feasible possibility exists to mitigate or avoid such adverse impact except through the disapproval of the project or approval at a lower density. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, as mentioned, the project proposes development of a new four-story mixed-use building with an approximate total of 74,290 square feet, including a ground floor of approximately 1,079 square feet of commercial tenant space, along with a 665 square foot semi-enclosed outdoor patio dining area as an extension of the interior area. Uh, features of the ground floor include a lobby entry providing access to residential amenities, including a mail package room, um, delivery room, a uh, bicycle parking spaces, resident storage and, and trash and recyclables room, and elevators leading to the second through fourth floors above. Um, positioned below the three residential floors, uh, again, containing a total of 105 square, excuse me, 105 single room occupancy uh, units or SROs. And again, the second through fourth floors include the residential units of 105 in total with 35 units on each floor. Um, the SROs range in size from 305 to 380 square feet. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this slide displays the floor plan of the first level. Hopefully that's visible. Um, on the left is a view of the basic programming components, including the commercial tenant space and the adjoining covered area in the front or the south facing Water Street. Uh, the surface parking at ground level occupies the majority of the bottom level of the building. On the right of the slide, uh, residential amenities are shown in green, such as the uh, lobby, um, the package delivery room, the bike parking and services area, such as corridors and stairs. And commercial components appear in orange red. Um, the ground floor outdoor open space can also be seen at the northerly side of the property, along with the staircase leading to the upper level. Uh, next slide, please. The second through fourth floors are visible on this slide. Uh, the second floor includes an uncovered landscape, open, use, open uh, usable outdoor space, accessible for both active and passive recreation opportunities, which can double as a community gathering space. And a second uh, story rooftop terrace is also located along the easterly side of the building. Um, and as of yet, unprogrammed amenity space appears near um, as well, and the second floor laundry room is additionally visible. On the right, uh, the third and fourth floors are uh, mirror images of one another or duplicates of one another with the layout of the second floor echoed through both the third and fourth floors, um, aside from the uh, second story uh, courtyard um, not being visible or not being present on the third and fourth floors. Um, but the interior courtyard does remain unenclosed and open to uh, the third and fourth floors is visible on the right-hand side of the slide. Uh, next slide, please. So on this slide, uh, renderings of the proposed elevations are shown. Uh, the architecture of the building can be described as modern or urban minimalist and a series of alternating angled building planes of fiber, cement, and stucco wrap onto all sides as seen on the elevations shown here. And a sweeping first floor covered entry portico um, creates a distinctive feature providing visual interest at the building's most prominent vantage point at its intersection of at the intersection of Water Stan <clears throat> Street and Stanford Avenue. And a regular pattern of windows provides a sense of organization and, and intentionality. Um, on Water Street, the covered entry and outdoor patio dining area are visible, um, set back from the public right of way by a low wall with protection from the elements provided by the second floor um, uh, overhead. And hanging vines included the second story rooftop terraces are shown, um, along with landscaping of the ground floor open space, which helped to soften the hard edges of the building's design. At the south or front elevation, metal awnings placed atop the first story introduce shadows and architectural detail. And a balanced three-tone color scheme provides compatibility to the appearance of the existing site and surrounding land uses. And a roof parapet measuring from two to four feet in height ensures screening of rooftop mechanical equipment. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as proposed, uh, vehicular access to the site is provided from Stanford Avenue. Um, a driveway provides access to the at-grade parking stalls located on ground floor, allowing for ingress and egress to SRO residents and visitors, as well as employees and patrons of the commercial uh, tenant space. An entry on Stanford Avenue to the residential lobby provides access from the ground floor by foot um, and residential units above for residents and their guests, as well as to building management staff. Access to the commercial space is provided through two separate entries along Water Street, and a separate entrance for residents, guests, and residential management staff is additionally provided on Water Street 
near the uh, southwest portion of the property. As mentioned, uh, surface parking is provided at ground level and would include a total of 49 parking stalls, including three ADA accessible stalls, eight electric vehicle stalls, and 12 as mechanical stack for parking. And 137 total bicycle parking spaces are provided, comprised of 107 class one stalls and 30 class two stalls for long-term bike storage. And a loading um, space is also provided midway along the frontage of the building on Stanford Avenue located adjacent to the refuse room, which allows for trash and recyclables pickup, as well as commercial deliveries and space for a resident move in and move out. Uh, next slide, please. Three commercial buildings uh, located at the subject site, as I mentioned earlier, have been designated for demolition. Uh, the single story commercial structure was constructed in 1965 for county assessor records. And likewise, the structure is situated at 923 Water Street, um, which is located in the southerly portion of that parcel is a one-story commercial building um, also uh, marked for demolition. And a third commercial building lies north of the first. The non-residential demolition authorization permit allows for consideration of the request for demolition of non-residential structures aged 50 years or older um, to ensure that those which have historic value, just like the uh, non-residential demolition perm authorization permit, are not demolished. Um, excuse me, uh, re reference there to the residential demolition authorization permit. And historic evaluation, uh, GPR 523, dated October 7, 2022, was prepared by historian Seth Bergstein of past consultants, which determines that uh, none of the three commercial structures appears eligible for the California Register of Historic Resources, the National Register, or the City of Santa Cruz Historic Building Survey. And also the single family residence additionally does not qualify for listing on any of the um, historic uh, surveys. Um, as a result, um, no protections are provided against demolition of any of the buildings under the California Environmental Quality Act, and demolition of the buildings may be approved through a non-residential demo demolition authorization permit for the commercial buildings and a residential demolition authorization permit for the, uh, the residential structure. Um, the state's density bonus law was adopted in 1979, as um, I'm sure you're all aware, encourages the provision of subsidized dwelling units by offering to developers a combination of benefits and incentives for development of a below market rate housing. Uh, for projects that include the required number of affordable housing units, uh, local jurisdictions are uh, required to allow more market rate units than otherwise accommodated by the applicable zoning dis designation. Approved incentives or concessions such as relaxed development standards, which result in actual and identifiable cost reductions for the project, um, authorize waivers or modifications, which would have the effect of physical, otherwise physically precluding development at the level allowable under density bonus law, and um, grant reduced parking requirements. With all that in mind, the project seeks to achieve um, a 50% density bonus above that uh, base density number of units included in a project fully conforming to all development standards by providing 15% of the base number of units restricted to occupancy by very low income households. The applicant has requested additionally three waivers, including a reduced rear yard setback of one foot three inches, whereas a five foot setback is a general development standard, an increased height of 48 feet and four stories, while four, 40 feet and three stories is allowed by the zoning ordinance, and an increased floor area ratio or FAR of 2.95 well, a maximum of 2.75 is allowed by the general plan land use designation of MXHD. The city is uh, required to grant the requested waivers unless a specific adverse consequence to health or safety would result. Uh, staff had found um, evidence of no such adverse consequence uh, through staff evaluation. And um, I'd like to also confirm that the project includes 14 SRO residential units offered at the very low income level, which equates to 20% of the number of residential units in the base density plans, uh, consistent with the minimum provision of affordable housing is required by municipal code and state density bonus law. And the project um, additionally complies with the objective standards of the East Side Business Area Improvement Plan, Main Street Character Zone, um, which are enforceable under the Housing Accountability Act as objective standards. An arborist report has been submitted indicating that two heritage sized trees will be removed due to conflicts with the location of the proposed building and the two trees remaining will be protected as required by conditions of approval. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, as mentioned, the project includes a total of 49 parking stalls. Uh, the proposed parking configuration includes stall dimensions of eight and a half feet in width by 18 feet in depth, slightly below the standard minimum dimensions of eight and a half uh, in width by 19 foot in depth. Uh, the municipal code allows for considerations of such variations should the commission find that the proposed configuration will properly function in quotes, um, that's what the, the code states, and not create a safety concern for those traversing the project area. And staff has found no uh, concern regarding the proposed size reduction due to spatial constraints and has found um, no evidence of any safety concern that would uh, manifest from the proposed parking design. Uh, further, mechanical parking has been proposed as allowable by the municipal code for stalls on site and located within an enclosed area. Um, a condition of approval requires submittal of literature or details of the proposed mechanical stacker units for staff review. Uh, for the applicant, um, the applicant has also requested a 32% reduction in standard stall numbers uh, required for parking capacity as allowable by the code. And uh, please note that a total of 49 stalls are proposed. Um, Unfortunately, there was an error in the staff report that uh, the table, the development standards table had a list of 57. That's erroneous. The total number of parking stalls proposed is 49. Um, the applicant has submitted the parking um, reduction worksheet required by code and has demonstrated that the supply is allowable, um, would be, uh, could be accommodated to um, fulfill the parking demand of the project. Um, a trip generation memo prepared by Hexadon uh, Transportation Consultants uh, projects that the project would generate 26 net new morning peak hour trips and eight net new afternoon evening peak hour trips, which are below the threshold required for preparation of a transportation impact study. Um, an environmental set assessment indicated um, existing soil contamination. The project will be required to comply with all requirements of the County Environmental Safety and Health Division Department regarding voluntary cleanup and a condition of approval has been added to this effect. Uh, next slide, please. The proposed development project constitutes a project under the California Environmental Quality Act, or CEQA. Uh, the project demonstrates consistency with all criteria required for a categorical exemption per Section 15332 of the CEQA guidelines, Class 32 categorical exemption. Uh, that is, the project would occur on a previously developed urban infill site, has no value as habitat for endangered, rare, or threatened species, is based on technical studies prepared and as condition would induce no impact to traffic, noise, air quality, or water quality, and can be adequately served by all required utilities and public services. Uh, next slide, please. Staff have made findings to support the proposed project. Um, please note a few corrections to the prepared documents. Um, please note that the notice of exemption attached to the uh, project application uh, references the applicant as Diana Alfaro, who is not affiliated with the proposed project. Please note the corrected party, um, the applicant will be identified in the notice of exemption that staff will correct uh, for filing with the county recorder's office. Additionally, please note that uh, the recommended condition of conditions of approval of the project require two corrections. Um, the reference for a single family home and condition of approval number 19 uh, should um, properly state mixed use project or mixed use development. And that's letter A in condition of approval number 19. And condition of approval number 34 in the recommended conditions of approval should be struck from the conditions due to its inact, um, inapplicability. Um, with that uh, noted, staff recommends that the planning commission acknowledge, uh, recommends that the planning commission acknowledge the environmental determination. And staff additionally recommends that the commission move to approve the request for special use permit design permit, non-residential demolition authorization permit, residential demolition authorization permit, lot line adjustment and heritage tree removal permit based upon the findings included and the conditions of approval attached to the staff report with the corrections that staff uh, mentioned uh, just a few moments ago. Next slide, please. Staff and the applicant are available to answer questions and thank you very much for your time. This concludes staff's presentation. Thank you, Mr. Meyer. Excellent report. Um, at this time, I'd like to come back to the commission and ask if there are any specific questions prior to receiving a report from the applicant. Uh, 
Okay, Commissioner Dawson. Yeah, thank you, staff, for that report. Um, I just wanted a little bit of clarification. Uh, the way that I understand code currently is, is there is no limit to the number of SRO units in a project. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, there's a theoretical um, limit. It's theoretically lim unlimited, correct? Okay. Um, so, um, so this project could have been built without the density bonus. Is that correct? So uh, one um, item that's uh, needed to be mentioned is that uh, the base density plans that are produced for the project are required to be fully conforming to all um, development standards. And so as stated in code and, and uh, as the um, staff report um, cites code sections, uh, the, uh, the um, density bonus units are based on the base density plans which again are uh, required to be conforming to all um, development standards. And so uh, with that in mind, the number of uh, base density units uh, prepared is, is 70. And so the uh, density bonus number is, is um, uh, derived from that base density number. Yeah, absolutely. I, I'm clear on how the density bonus works with on the base density um I'm, I'm just a little i'm trying to understand why the applicant wasn't required because if there, there's no uh limit on sro units and they could build 105 units um why we wouldn't be requiring uh 20 percent affordability on the entire project like it didn't need to go through the density bonus project i'm trying to understand that Right. So um, the number of affordable units is based on the base density plans, and um, that's a requirement, you know, both in the code and and um, that's the design of the project uh, results from that. Um, I can jump in there too. Um, so thanks, Tim. That's that's all um, correct. But for SROs in the general plan designation for this parcel in particular, there is an FAR. So that's the floor area ratio that limits the number of units that can be in that building. Um, we've had that in our code for um, several years, I think since 2020, um, when we started having these mixed use projects in like the CC zone district where there is no density and people were asking for density bonuses and we were trying to figure out how to, what to apply the density bonus to. So I think around 2020, we added to our code that, um, an applicant would be required to prepare base density plans. And we would determine what that base density is by way of the objective standards that you would apply to the property and any FAR that would be applicable as well. So um, we've had that in our code for some time. And then um, that also just got applied to the state law as well. So legislation was just approved that basically um, mimicked our language that we had in the in the municipal code and basically says the same thing that if there is no density specified in the general plan that we will prepare base plans to determine what that density is and that that base density would act as the density upon which we would apply the density bonus and then also the inclusionary units for that for that's per our code too. So it's not that there is just an unlimited density for SROs. It's that SROs, one bedroom units, other units um, are allowed to exceed the density in the in the general plan if that is applicable. So um, that's what we've applied in this scenario. Okay, thanks. That helped. Thank you, Commissioner Masidi Miller. Yeah, I want to. Um, echo Commissioner Dawson's compliments to the staff on the excellent staff report. Uh, really uh, great work, very thorough. Um, I had a question about the reduced rear setback. Um, as I understand it, the code requires five feet, but it's been reduced, uh, been a request for a waiver to reduce it to one foot three inches. Are there any uh, fire code issues with respect to that setback that um, need to be addressed or have been addressed? Um, that's my question. Right. Uh, thank you for that question, uh, Commissioner. Um, 
the the project plans have been reviewed by the fire department and um, the fire department hasn't expressed any any concern and it's uh, noted that um, the existing um, structures to the rear are, are located a significant distance away from the property line and um, uh, I think to answer um, briefly the fire department has had no concerns with the proposed uh, design thank you I had one other question about the um, automatic parking system or stacked parking system uh, I was curious about this particular product so I went to the website from the manufacturer's website and it appears that the um, stacker model specified for this project is a is one that typically specified for uh, an it needs an attendant it's it falls under the you know attended uh, parking and I'm wondering if staff has considered that or the owners considered that in choosing this uh, product for this project Right. So I, um, one of the conditions of approval for the project was um, uh, submittal of, of details or literature regarding the final stack parking design. And um, if concerns um, arise related to the design as proposed, um, staff uh, are, uh, have the ability to, to request um, changes to that uh, model. And so I think uh, for that question, I'd probably defer to the applicant uh if uh, they have additional uh comments or insight to lend to the uh the model that's being selected for the stack parking now thank you for that answer could you refer me to the uh condition of approval that's um you're you're discussing there I'm sure um, may have missed that in my review right um let's see i have it here so Okay, it's a uh, condition of approval number 30. Which, 30, thank you. Yeah. I'll take a look at it. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. Sure. Commissioner Kennedy. Commissioner Kennedy, do you have a question? Hey, can you hear, hear me now? Yes. Uh, great presentation, Tim, thank you. Um, I have two questions. One, I'm working on understanding the parking calculations, and it looks like of those total 49, 35 of those are like for the residential units. Is that right after the reductions? The, the parking calculation, so- I'm uh, looking at just the page uh, GP0.02, like project info. Okay, sure. Yeah, right. So the um, we'll look here. So the um, uh, okay, zooming in here. So the uh, the the total number of required parking stalls per standard code um, provisions are the uh, uh, fifty three um, parking spaces for um, let's see uh, for the. Um, residential units and it was nine for the commercial tenant space um, and that's um, a total of 62 and through the request for the uh, 32 percent which is applicable um, reduction for the standard code requirements that comes down to 42 total um, and uh, the, the applicants proposed 49 in total and so I I don't believe, and, and again, the applicant can um, lend more insight on this. I don't believe that an actual kind of program for parking allocation or um, kind of parking, uh, um, um, I guess, designation of, of individual spots has been proposed. I haven't seen that. I believe that um, the way the parking program has been uh, put together so far, it's it's all kind of shared parking that's uh, within the code requirement for total number. Um, if that parking, I guess, configuration design has been updated since the plans were presented, again, maybe that's something that the applicant can speak more about. Okay, sounds good. Where I'm headed with this is the current code requires like 12% of EVSC EV chargers installed for residential. And uh, that's why I was asking that question. I'm thinking about maybe some more EV chargers um, for this project. Sure. 
Um, thank you. Second question is just regarding like traffic impacts and neighborhood impacts. Um, is there currently residential permit parking on Stanford? I meant to go over there and look, but I didn't have time today. Right. Yeah, there's currently no um, residential permit parking in the neighborhood at all. And uh, that question had been raised as part of this project. Um, one of the concerns of the residents was um, potential loss of on-street parking. And uh, uh, the applicant had originally actually um, uh, broached the idea of a permit parking program. Uh, the the requirements for establishing a permit parking are though um, are are kind of rigorous and they require the the neighborhood itself to initiate that permit parking program and it requires mm -hmm. um, a two thirds vote of the neighborhood to approve and the the uh, there's funding that's required to be um, compiled and put together and presented so uh, it's kind of a, a, a again a lengthy set of requirements um, as of the uh, present time oh. of parking in, in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So to be clear, I wouldn't expect the applicant to pay for that, but that would be an right. for, for parking issues to uh, arise in the future. Right, right. Okay, and then just finishing off on that, a lot of these projects, like on a commercial corridor with uh, residents right behind it, I understand the residents concern about traffic and stuff so have there been any conversations with the applicant about fall balance for the you additional know, street improvements or to kind of help lessen that effect right um one of the required uh off-site improvements that i didn't mention in, in my presentation is that uh, there's a required bulb out to be installed um, at the corner of stanford and water avenue to uh, kind of mitigate um, what otherwise might be kind of uh, fast traffic movement on okay. southbound Stanford Avenue. And uh, there's also a requirement for a dedicated left turn lane on eastbound Water Street onto northbound Stanford Avenue, which again is intended to help um, safe travel through the area for both pedestrians and bicyclists as well as uh, motorists. Oh, great. Uh, thank you. I just missed it. I'm glad that it's in there already. Sure. And uh, appreciate your answer to the questions. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I have uh, a, a question really following up on what I guess is a lot of our concerns, which is how parking is going to be managed, um, acknowledging that this is early in the project. But I am curious about uh, which of the tenants will have access to parking, how that will be managed. And um, I also, that you know, includes for me um, how the property uh, is going to be managed in general. Um, I know that there is a requirement for a property management plan, which is really important. Um, but managing this property um, at this density in this location, I think is going to be really important. So I'll be curious to hear what the applicant has to say about that. So, okay, any other questions from the commission? Um, seeing none, we'll get a, a presentation from the applicant. Uh, hello, my name is Omar Hassan. I'm a designer here at Workbench. Are you all able to hear me? Could I get a thumbs up or a, oh, I see nodding. Great. Awesome. Well, thank you very much uh, for having us tonight. And thank you, Tim Mayer. You promised a thorough presentation and you delivered. So. We're going to fly through these uh, slides pretty quickly. And thanks uh, in advance, Sam, for uh, advancing the slides for me. And uh, we're really excited to be here and talk about the Stanford Studios project. It's something we've been working on for you know almost a year now. Um, if we jump to the next slide, I want to start with the project statement. And this is really the inception of the project overall, which was to provide Santa Cruz with thoughtfully designed housing that is respectful of local needs. And you know the developer, uh, Andy, he's uh, lived in town for almost 15 years. Uh, the workbench team is a local team. You know, we really want to be a part of the solution to the, the housing challenges we're um, facing here in Santa Cruz, and we're excited about how this project can contribute. Um, if you jump to the next slide, and maybe skip to one more, we got a lot of title slides in here. It's very design oriented. Um, 
you know, this is pulled from the Santa Cruz housing blueprint and um, it's part of the inception of the program, which is Santa Cruz needs smaller units like SROs for retirees and students. So families can occupy single family homes where these groups presently uh, reside. And, you know, that's something that we keep in mind as we're working on this project. If you jump to the next slide, I'm not going to read all of these points. This will be provided to everyone to dive into more. But, you know, the, the key takeaways is providing, you know, smaller uh, housing units reduces the cost of the housing and provides more attainable, affordable housing. Uh, it, it meets a need that is not currently being met in Santa Cruz with a unique housing type. And uh, it helps local people find places to live. You know, young people growing up in Santa Cruz who want to move out of home and find a place to land in Santa Cruz are having a hard time doing that now. And we think this project is part of the solution. Um, next slide, please. Uh, Tim's done a great job of setting up, you know, where this project is located in Santa Cruz. Just piggybacking off of that, you know, we're kind of on the edge of this midtown neighborhood on the border of this commercial area along Water Street, which is that major thoroughfare and uh, on this uh, single family uh, neighborhood, just to the top of the page here, uh, really in a walkable, bikeable, uh, you know, uh, public transportation oriented site uh, that is kind of rare in Santa Cruz. Uh, if you hop to the next slide, uh, again, just hammering home the idea that, you know, Workbench is a Santa Cruz local firm and we all live in this community and we're excited to see something happening on this site. Um, if you hop to the next slide, um, I'm not going to read all of these stats because, again, Tim did a great job talking about, you know, all of these points. Um, just, you know, key takeaways, three, three levels of housing over a ground floor commercial podium with parking. Uh, there's a 20% very low income uh, units being provided. Uh, and there will be, you know, per SRO code, there is required 24 hour on site management and there is a manager's unit provided in the floor plants. Um, and that's a part of the building design. Uh, hop to the next slide. Uh, just talking a little bit more about the commercial space and really envisioning this as, as a potential neighborhood hub and an amenity to the community overall. And then again, some of the stats on the parking that, you know, may be outdated. I would defer to what Tim has pulled out as the latest greatest. Um, if you hop to the next slide, um, just taking a look at who we think will live in Stanford Studios, uh, the ULI prepared a document about micro units and, and SRO housing. And, uh, you know, the primary profile for people living here are young professionals, young singles, people under the age of 30, but there is a, a secondary market for couples or roommates or even older people who are looking to downsize. And, you know, the major incentive of going small is to find uh, something more affordable and it provides people the opportunity to live alone where they otherwise might have to have multiple roommates and these types of projects do well in really highly walkable energetic neighborhoods with access to services and commercial spaces and essentially you know exactly where this project is cited um, next slide please this is a look at a typical unit and we're you know really early in the design phases here but taking a stab at something that is designed to work really well and efficiently in a small amount of space. And so each unit has an efficiency kitchen and a private bathroom, as well as a uh, living slash sleeping space. On the left there, you see an idea about creating a bed nook to get some privacy for uh, people that might be sharing this space. But, you know, really trying to optimize this small footprint and, and provide as much storage and clever design as we can to make it very livable. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, Tim, again, did a really great job talking about, you know, this site has been a, a kind of a, a, a blighted uh, site with, uh, you know, junk cars and other, you know, dilapidated buildings on site. And um, we're really excited to be seeing something new coming to this area of town. Uh, you can see dash to the north of the site is not the subject of tonight's meeting, but it is a future project on a parcel that is owned by the same developer. And if you jump to the next slide, um, there's a vision of what this future project could be. And the intent is that this is kind of a buffer site. So the idea is that the Stanford Studios, you know, maximizes density and capitalizes on that urban frontage. And that future project is really envisioned as a buffer, kind of mediating between the single family residences and the uh, density of the studios building. Uh, one more slide, you have a good diagram here showing the stepping down of the scale of the building and how, you know, an attempt to, uh, 
again, maximize density on Water Street and kind of drop down that density as you go down Stanford Ave. And then one more slide, you'll see the shadow studies from our project and how even in the winter, the majority of the shadows from this four-story building are falling on that uh, future buffer site. And so this was a really well received in our community meetings and it's a really clever strategy that uh, the developers put together to try and minimize the impact and be really sensitive of how this new uh, project will affect the neighborhood. Uh, one more slide, please. So, uh, you know, just some thoughts about how this project is really envisioned to be a good neighbor. And I won't talk about these because we have a lot of good graphics that support some of these. So if we just keep hopping forward to the next slide. Uh, traffic and parking is something we've already heard a lot about. <laughs> uh, if you go one more slide. You know, um, we, we are trying to make really great connections here for people that want to live in a car-free community. And uh, we're really disincentivizing cars by charging for parking separate from the uh, residences. Um, the, it, we are actually thinking about uh, providing priority to residents that apply without owning a vehicle, which you can do. Um, and we're trying to target people that want to live in Santa Cruz and drive less and bike more or walk more. This is a super walkable part of town, and that's really the, the target audience for this uh, project. If you go to the next slide, in our community meeting, this is what we got a lot of the feedback about, and, and Tim Mayer uh, talked a lot about this. You know, there was uh, one of the concerns we heard several times was about the lack of a left turn lane off of Water Street. And our project team, you know, we push for this and we lobby for this, and we would love to see that incorporated into the project. Um, another point we think that's worth talking about is since submitting this project initially, AB 2097 has gone into effect, which would significantly reduce the parking required for this project as it qualifies for AB 2097, which would essentially mean only providing EV and ADA parking. Uh, the project team has elected to maintain the originally proposed amount of parking, and uh, we are meeting city code requirements with the amount of parking we are proposing currently. Um, next slide, please. So uh, these are some of the strategies uh, Tim already did talk about for reducing uh, parking, and this is all provided in our parking reduction worksheet. Um, one more slide, please. It's a super walkable area. I can't hammer this home enough. Like there, uh, there are very few areas in Santa Cruz that have as many major groceries and amenities nearby. Um, one more slide will show the bike transit times from this location. And, you know, within 30 minutes, you're getting to some of the major uh, destinations in Santa Cruz. Santa Cruz has the third highest percentage of workers commuting via bicycle. And we hope that Stanford Studios can take advantage of this network of bike paths. And then one more slide. The site is also located really close to a major transit stop and has access to some of the best of uh, Santa Cruz's public transportation and, and really can take advantage of that just based on its location. Uh, one more slide forward, please. I, I won't get into too much detail here because Tim Mayer did talk a lot about this, um, just showing the how the uh, parking garage is accessed as well as some of the bike parking provided and bike amenities for the residents. Uh, one more slide, please. I think this was our key point as we were thinking about this project is, you know, more parking equals more traffic equals more impact. and. Our goal really is to appeal to people that want to live in a car-free community. This is a walker's paradise, a biker's paradise. And so less parking equals less traffic equals less impact. Uh, one more slide, please. So getting into some of the design strategies, and you can skip ahead to the next one. You know, looking at Midtown, it's a super vibrant part of town. Lots of beautiful colors, really strong architectural style. Um, murals, tile accents on the walls, lots of great planting. It, it really embodies that kind of Santa Cruz vibe. Uh, if you go one more slide, you'll see an image of our massing. And, you know, we really put a lot of effort into carving away at the, what could be a, a bulky, massive building. And that area represented in blue shows how we're stepping back the project as much as we can and carving out to create light and uh, bring greenery and pockets of outdoor space along the pedestrian experience. Um, those orange kind of zigzags are highlighting the articulation we're proposing to create kind of a distinct building identity and something that's different than the typical flat uh, formulaic building that we see a lot of nowadays. Uh, one more slide, please. 
at looking at how the ground floor is being articulated, you know, we put a lot of effort into creating some visual interest, creating that really great pedestrian experience that upholds the the goals of the general plan and kind of brings that vibrancy and urban quality to Water Street that we think it's dying for. Um, and, you know, adding multiple points of greenery at multiple levels of the building. Uh, one more slide, please. Um, I, I think we can skip past these slides because Tim did a really great job walking us through the floor plan. So you could go ahead one more, just, you know, really highlighting the, the commercial space on water and, and the terrace available to residents on level two and kind of a double loaded corridor uh, orientation of the building. One more slide, please. And now getting into the exterior design, as I am almost out of breath, one more slide, please. So looking for uh, local material precedents, as you all know, Santa Cruz has a super eclectic style. You can find a precedent for any style you want to pursue. There's a lot of great examples of mid-century modern buildings, a lot of mission style, really great stucco buildings. There's also this great sort of ag heritage with UCSC and great uses of wood all around town. So if you go to the next slide, you'll see our proposed material palette is really inspired by this. We're proposing a lot of uh, white fiber cement and white stucco. Uh, we're looking to introduce warmth with some wood siding in the soffits and in the walls in select areas. Uh, looking for opportunities to introduce colorful pattern wall tile at you know the entries of buildings and, and moments of kind of human scale interaction and pattern metal screens. So really trying to pull from all of those precedents that we saw just ahead. Uh, one more slide, please. So this is the last look at the site. You've seen this a few times now. And one more step forward is the renderings. It's not nearly the same effect. Tim Mayer really spoiled the surprise. It's so fun to go from the, the former site to the new one. You see those cool buildings. Anyways, so <laughs> this is, uh, you know, and uh, Sam, you can kind of just step through these as we go uh, forward. The the proposed design, you can see sort of that articulation and building identity we're trying to create here. Those moments of warmth in the wood siding and soffits. This is the commercial frontage here that we're really imagining will uh, contribute to that kind of activation on Water Street and bring some warmth and light to the area and encourage pedestrian use on Water Street. You can take, yeah, thank you. Uh, this is a uh, look at the residential lobby and then a, a closer look at the commercial space and the associated outdoor dining spaces. And uh, one more slide forward. So I know I talked really fast. I really appreciate everyone's time and patience and attention. Uh, you know, our final three points is, you know, the goal of this project is to provide attainable housing for the community, to minimize the negative impact on the neighborhood and to be attentive to local concerns. And, you know, we're really excited to see this project come as far as it has. And we're hoping that it'll make a big impact on the housing needs in Santa Cruz and really appreciative of everyone's time tonight. So thank you very much. Thank you for that uh, presentation. That was great. This is a public hearing. And at this point, I would like to um, open the public hearing um, by starting out asking how many people believe they would like to speak to address this item. Could you please raise your hand? I know it's hard to tell right away, trying to make an estimate. We have quite a few participants tonight. Um, I'm going to uh, limit public comment to two minutes. Um, and uh, with that, um, with uh, Tess, we'll open the public hearing. And um, Chair, just so that everyone knows, our timer has kind of a, a bad reaction with Zoom. So when the two minutes is up, you'll hear me say time. We're going to do it the old-fashioned way. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, here's our first speaker. Okay, uh, go ahead and please identify yourself. Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Ryan Meckel. I'm calling in as a neighbor and community resident. I just want to say I have seen a lot of housing projects come through Santa Cruz in my time here, and I know you have as well. I just wanted to say I truly love this one. I think it might be my favorite, and I would love to see these all over Santa Cruz. Um, the emphasis on like a car light design, emphasis of activating that water street to pedestrians, low impact on the surrounding community, 
uh, the bike storage. I could go on and on <laughs> truly about this project and how much I love it. Um, it's something that appeals to me. I'm a young professional living in Santa Cruz. I don't own a car. I get around by bike. So, like this is the project for me. And there's a lot of other people like me looking for something like this in Santa Cruz. Um, I would love to be able to move out of the house that I'm in right now, sharing with two other people unrelated to me to make room for a family that could live here instead. And having opportunities like these come up throughout Santa Cruz provides that option for students, for young professionals like the developer and staff were saying, for the people who don't need a whole house or don't want a whole house or don't want, you know, the higher housing costs. This is a perfect, perfect project for people like me. And it's a great fit for Santa Cruz. So I'm totally in support of the staff's recommendation. And I do hope you approve this. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comment. Uh, uh, go ahead, Mr. Orizi. Hi, thank you. Um, I am a member of the uh, community here in my neighborhood, and I wanted to first uh, commend Andy Goldberg, the uh, developer. He has met with us a couple of times uh, all along the, his um, planning, and he's met with neighbors. He's been very receptive. Um, no, we don't want this gigantic building there, but we understand housing's needed. It's going to go somewhere. He has put some good design elements into this for us. Um, uh, a couple comments. Um, I, I feel it was, I can't understand how the traffic impact could be denied. That was really dismissive uh, by uh, planning. I don't know. There's going to be a huge traffic impact no matter what even 49 spaces or whatever, all coming into Stanford Avenue, it's going to be really bad for our neighborhood and for people trying to use the arterial of Water Street. Also, um, the one and a half uh, foot setback that's being asked for, um, that's fine with the promise of what the future development is going to be on the other parcels, which is promised to be two-story duplexes with ADUs. So great. So we won't need a huge setback on the north side, but we don't know if that the future promised development is going to happen on the other lots between Stanford and Branson 40. Um, please, <laughs> I will rally to the city to get one of our bike share stations right there and very prominent. I wanted to also mention, I'm hoping that the Parking um, spaces included in the plans do not include the parking spaces directly on Water Street because um, we, as the active cyclists on uh, this side of the town and people who use it, are hoping to get those parking spaces eliminated on right. Water Street safety. Uh, thank you for listening to me and let's go forward. Thank you. Uh, let's see. Next, we have um, phone number ending in 0193. Please go ahead, identify yourself, please. And you are muted. Here you go. Good evening. My name is Henry Hooker, and I'm calling on behalf of Santa Cruz EMB in support of this project. We sent a letter of support so I'll simply emphasize here that this is an example of the type of project that our city desperately needs to respond to the housing and climate crisis. Near jobs, and schools, and public transit, and it facilitates a car-free lifestyle. It's respectful of its neighbors and provides 105 much needed homes. We urge the Planning Commission to move the permits forward on this project. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Uh, we have uh, uh, Wochi, you're next. My, can you hear me? Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I ha I'm trying to figure out you, on the commercial picture, you show a bistro, but there is no parking. So where are the people, if you're going to have commercial space down there, where are people going to park? because even if there's parking on Water Street, that's only like five max, four maximal spaces. So where are these 
people who are going to go to the bistro or going to go to a paint store or whatever it is going to go in there, where are they going to park? That's my question. Thank you. Thank you. And next we have um, Susan Morin. You are yeah. yes. Um, hi. Um, I'm I live in the neighborhood and I just had one question about the traffic flow. Um, how will people, I, 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 I'm glad that there'll be a left-hand turn into Stanford, but how would one make a left-hand turn out of Stanford onto Water Street? Is there going to be some kind of, uh, you know, traffic uh, changes to allow a left-hand turn out of Stanford Avenue. So um, that's my question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Rafa Sonnenfeld, you're, not, you're next. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, I'm just calling in on behalf of EMB Law um, to remind the commission that under the Housing Accountability Act, um, because the um, city staff has determined this project uh, is consistent with the objective planning standards that um, the city is required to approve it and uh, cannot reduce its density or or make any um, changes that would make it infeasible to develop. I think this is a great project for city of Santa Cruz and it sounds like um, there are lots of folks who are supportive of it. So I'm um, looking forward to your approval this evening. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Um, uh, Ali Spearman. That's Sapperman, sorry about that. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Ali Saperman. I'm calling in on behalf of the Housing Action Coalition. Just want to echo um, some previous comments I heard tonight. Uh, Ryan's uh, definitely in support of the staff recommendation. Only caveat: wish the density was a lot higher. You know, we're housing around a hundred people. It'd be great if it was more like a thousand. Uh, but Amazing design, really excited to see it developed and approved. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next we have Michael Funari. Please go ahead, Thank, welcome. Um, hi, uh, I'm just, um, I'm curious, there's, there's a plan to have lower density on the north part of this development but there is no commitment. There's nothing in my mind to um, be confident that in a year, two years, three years from now, there won't be plans for another three, four, five, six story um, building behind this uh, proposed development. Um, I guess that's my, my major concern. Are there any comments about that? Thank you for your comment. Let's see. I am not seeing um, any more members of the public, but I want to um, allow for a moment to raise your hand and uh, speak with us. Okay. Seeing none. Oh, did I, did I hear somebody, Tess? Yeah, there is a, a member of the public just raised their hand. Okay, thank you. I don't see him. Please go ahead. Hi, my name is Sue Terrence. I'm in the neighborhood as well. Um, I think a lot of things have been incorporated to consider neighborhood needs. I am concerned that, um, you know, there's a lot of talk about how the arena numbers have, um, are much greater for the next cycle, but the next cycle starts in 2024. And uh, in this project, 14 units are scheduled to be very low income. That means there's 91 units that will not count toward the new green numbers um, 
the 14 units will count toward this cycle's very low income. But since very low income is the only category that we haven't already met, it means that there are many developments that are, the numbers aren't counting at all. So it's kind of a developer's loophole that all of these things that are are being built are satisfying um, none of the RENA numbers. Do you, uh, maybe I haven't expressed that very well, but um, it, it, it just seems to me like we are adding huge numbers without um, regard to what it's going to mean when we get our next RENA cycle um, because there are so many in this cycle that are not really being counted at all. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Are there any other members of the public that would like to address the commission this evening? Leaving just a little uh, bit for the delay, but seeing none, uh, with that, we'll close uh, the public hearing. And uh, thank you, everyone, for your comments. Uh, at this point, we'll return to the commission and um, ask if uh, in any commissioners would like to start. Commissioner Gordon. Um, mine's, well, the, I think it was a great presentation. I um, live in the neighborhood and, um, you know, it is a blighted, area. So uh, I really appreciate um, the developer um, making this move. Um, my um, question is pretty specific. <laughs> um, we've worked on a lot of projects, primarily older buildings that um, don't have chases sized appropriately and don't ha or don't have them at all. And this causes issues and limitations for the ground floor tenants. Um, in, in reviewing the drawings, um, I didn't see a chase designed in to accommodate for um, the restaurant and cafe space. And I'm just wondering if this was something that, um, that was considered by the design team um, in regards to uh, making that space more functional now and, and giving commercial space option um, for the future. And if it wasn't considered, I guess my question would be, would you be amenable to adding this to as a condition of approval during the construction drawing um, development? Um, Commissioner Gordon, can you hear me? This is Jamili speaking. Yeah. Hi. OK. Uh, hey, um, I, th I think we have, we might not have that all detailed, but we have thought through if there's a like if there's a restaurant tenant there that we're going to need to accommodate for exhaust and um chases and vents and things like that so it's not detailed but we are thinking about it okay would you be amenable to adding it to the conditions of approval um, i can check with the developer uh, okay. and let you know in just a moment yeah okay you so those, that that was mainly my. <laughs> it comes up so much in our in in our world, so I just want to bring it up. It's a good point. I'm going to move on, and then um, if we get an answer to that from the developer, um, please let me know, and uh, we'll come back. In the meantime, I'd like to identify Commissioner Kennedy. Hi, so um, I also just really like this project. It seems to fit into Santa Cruz. And I just feel like the site is really needing um, some rehabilitation. So I wanted to point out the row of street trees on the on the frontage there. That's gonna make a huge impact on this neighborhood. This neighborhood really needs some tender loving care in terms of the streetscape. Um, 
responding to the public, there was one question about the arena numbers. And I just wanted to point out there's a great dashboard online. If you just type in like California housing dashboard, it's kind of like a scorecard for the cities of uh, where we are with our past and future arena goals. So I found it really helpful because this confused that out of me. So um, go check it out. It's really helpful to understand what we've built and what we need to build. Um, so I'm really in favor of uh, moving this project forward. The one thing I would like to add is some additional electric vehicle charging spaces. And this is a cost, but it's a small cost, and it's an investment in apartment dwellers being able to charge their EV overnight where they live. Um, and I just think it's really important as we build parking garages, acknowledging the efforts that have been made to minimize parking. It doesn't seem unreasonable to me to prepare for like one in five EV. So I'd like to propose uh, what solutions made just boosting that up a little bit. That'd be two additional EV installed spots from nine to eleven. So I'm bringing it up now instead of just as a friendly amendment to ask the developer how they would feel about that and confirm that it's a uh, you know small cost but not a project killer. Hey, thank you, uh, Commissioner Dawson. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I do also want to um, just commend the developer. Um, I, I too am in the neighborhood here on the east side, very close to this project. Um, and uh, I've heard a lot of neighbors say that the developer and the design team has really gone out of the way to try to make the accommodations. I think that that is great. Um, I think the design is really good as well. I do want to just enter into the record and just be very clear to the public and remind all of the commissioners that with density bonus projects, we are not getting 20% affordable on the total units. In this project here, we're getting 13.3% affordable units. That is the letter of the law, absolutely. But I just want to again point out that the, the development that we are doing in the city is vastly under serving the need. Um, and I think that our council members and the commissioners where we can should think about ways where we can increase that. One of the ways we could increase that, and the city attorney has already weighed in on this, is that we could choose to try to move forward a policy that for density bonus projects, the required um, inclusionary on the base density would be higher. So that in the end on the total units, we would be getting our 20% inclusionary, which was the intent. So I just want to, again, make that very clear to the public that we are not getting 20%. And yes, it is the letter of the law, but we are getting 13.3%. So that is always tough for me, knowing the, the vast need for um, low-income housing um, in the city. And then secondly, I do want to say that I have given myself a crash course in um, trip generation and um, and cumulative impacts of projects over the last week or so. And um, I think the city is really, I think this project presents us with an opportunity to um, perhaps continue this project so that we can get a real handle on the traffic impact and a real transparent calculation of traffic traffic impact for these types of projects. We have two of the largest developments outside of the downtown area going in right next to each other and nowhere in any of the analyses are we looking at the cumulative traffic impact of those two projects. So I think in the long run, you know, this is going to move forward, but I think the city really puts ourselves at risk with this categorical exemption um, by not having a better, more transparent um, and and kind of cutting edge best practices around cumulative impact. Um, there's documented uh, peer reviewed papers that say there there is some real issues with the kind of traditional way that traffic impact has been done, including the way that we do it in this city. And cities are moving away from that because it is vastly underestimating the number of trips. So I think we have an opportunity here to take a step back get our ducks in a row, 
for these types of projects because we're going to have more and more projects like this. But again, I want to emphasize that these are the two, it's over 250 units um, going in right next to each other. And we don't really have any cumulative impact analysis of that. So um, I'll leave my comments there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Paul Hamas. Thank you. And uh, thank you to Tim and Samantha for uh, the presentation and also to uh, Mr. Hassan and you know the rest of the applicant team for uh, providing us with a pretty thorough look at what this project is going to look like. Um, I, I would echo the rest of the commission's comments. I really like this project. I think that uh, it's a good area to do this. And I think that, um, you know, the design concept and everything looks really good. And I, I really support this project. I'm curious, um, I, I'm not sure who on the development team, um, I should ask this. I'm, I'm just curious, uh, we got some figures on what the very low income units are going to rent for. I'm curious if there's any figures for the other 91, if there's any ballpark for that. Is, is uh, Commissioner Polanis, this is Jamili Cannon on the design team. Um, let me check with the developer and I'll answer that. And then when you're done with questions, I have answers to the other amendments as well or uh, suggestions. But you can go ahead and finish your. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, no problem. And then um, my next question, I, I would echo uh, Commissioner Dawson's comments on just affordability percentages. Um, and uh, I guess my question is, is there any way to increase the number of affordable units. I mean, obviously I don't want to make this project infeasible, but I wouldn't feel good going to bed tonight if we didn't at least ask. And I know that's, you know, a bigger question uh, that you may not have an immediate response for, but, um, you know, I thought I'd throw it out there. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Commissioner Maxwell. Yes, thank you. Um, First of all, thanks for the presentation. Thanks, Samantha, for the slide uh, assistance with the emergency um, and for everybody's uh, work tonight. I definitely want to, again, the project is beautiful, man. I don't, I've don't. i sat through so many uh, presentations at this point, and it looks beautiful. Um, definitely parking seems to be quite an issue, especially if we are going to add the commercial uh, spaces. Uh, I've my kids went to school across the street uh, for elementary, and I know that intersection really well. And especially when we're considering A31 water going in, I mean, wow. I don't know why we don't get a traffic study. Um, well, maybe I don't know about continuing this item to get one. Seems like the momentum is pushing forward. That being said, um, we should be careful because this is going to be impacted, impacting a major intersection in our city. Um, and hopefully everybody rides a bike, but we can't promise that. Um, definitely regarding the affordability, um, as we just saw our, our uh, new mayor and city council require 20% on the South of Laurel project plan. We don't know how it's going to work out, but they passed it in council. We are getting 13.3% which seems like uh, Commissioner Polhama said, I, I don't know if I could go walk away from this meeting uh, approving this project based off of 13.3% affordability when we are in an emergency housing crisis. We all agree on that. State, the state agrees on that. That's why we're in the position we are in right now. Um, I'm wondering if the applicant would be willing to at least meet us at 15%, which would be just two additional units. That way, I could approve this project, go to sleep well tonight, and uh, look forward to seeing this project really uh, manifest because I think it's going to be beautiful. So um, that that would be my uh, request, and I look forward to hearing from anybody else. Thanks. Okay. Um, yeah, I'd like to follow up on, on uh, some of those as well. And first of all, I really want to congratulate um, the team. It really is a beautiful project. Um, and I'm really, really happy to see it. Um, I also um, understand for the neighbors and um, that this really is a significant change. And, you know, change, it, it's a big change. 
even if it is exactly the type of change that we chose when we approved the general plan, we decided we don't want the growth that we have to accommodate in our neighborhoods. We want it on our corridors. And um, I know a lot of us were hoping we would have beautiful buildings. And I think this one really um, manages to pull that off. And um, we are gonna provide housing that has been so sorely lacking for the singles, um, for seniors, um, for some students. Um, and the whole idea there, it's been mentioned a couple of times, but um, we've been underbuilding for this population. And as a result, we've got overcrowded single family homes, um, housing people in roommate situations who would prefer not to. Um, so this is a, a really exciting project. And um, I know some comments said they, they wish there was family housing included. And I, I really disagree with that. I think this is um, the right unit mix um, uh, for this spot. And I also think it's gonna be a real leader in terms of helping us move away from such a car dependent culture. Um, so I'm really happy um, to see that. Um, I also feel like uh, one of the things I was excited about, I spent years trying to place people who, um, to find places for people who have section eight um, housing and there's so few single family or uh, single room occupancy units available that I do expect that there's going to be, this could be a resource um, and uh, for um, additional people that will not be deed restricted affordable, but it will be a resource um, uh, uh, more informally. And I'm glad to see that as well. Um, so uh, with that, I think um, Ms. Cannon was gonna respond to uh, some of the questions that commissioners have come up with. Yes, happy to respond, Commissioner Conway. Um, so, on the commercial, the commercial chase that Commissioner Gordon asked about, we're happy to add that as a condition of approval. Um, I think we've we have plans for where to put it. We just don't have it in yet. Um, like not formally in the drawings, but we have thought through it and happy to add that. Um, the. EV charging stations, if you wanted to have a condition of approval be that we had two more, so we had 11 instead of nine, we're happy to accommodate that. Um, Andy, the developer has also said he's gonna continue to look at pursuing even more of those if we can. Um, so we will do everything we can in, in our power to get more there, um, but happy to be at 11. And then on the rental prices, um, market rate for, for this um, not, affordable units right now is around two thousand dollars a month and that's what we would like to see as well um i think that uh, commissioner conway you also brought up earlier just about the property management in particular and uh we will have an on-site manager and a professional management company along with you know, the rest of the requirements in the property management plan okay thank you for that and commissioner maxwell you have your hand up yeah, I think um, I guess I should have asked with if we could add within the conditions of the approval that the applicant include an additional two affordable units, um, very low or low, but affordable units uh, included in the conditions of approval. So we take it to a total of 16 units if they're willing. I can I can answer that. Um, Oh, well, is, can you all hear me? Mr. Gordon? It's really low. Please go ahead. Um, we are not getting an audio. Is this? Um, one second. I think that Tim is going to try to answer this question on the affordability component, and his audio is he's changing that. Can you one hear second. me now? There it is. Thank you so much. Hi, I'm Tim. I'm one of the owners at Workbench and I've uh, been working on this project along with the project team and, and Andy for a while um, since we started. So I just want to talk about the affordability component. Um, you know, we at Workbench have a lot of projects, um, thousands of units, and we on as many projects as we can have an ethos to create the highest affordability possible. We have projects that are 100% affordable. We have projects that are workforce housing, homeless service housing, all kinds of things that really serve the community. And that's always our number one goal. Um, 
the reality is with the way interest rates are going, cost of construction, as we all know, through the roof, there's a tipping point in every project where, you know, if we start to add an affordability component that is too great, the project can't ever get built because it doesn't have the correct amount of rent versus cost. It's a reality that we all live with. Um, and so we look at it on a project by project basis. For this one, unfortunately, the levels that it's set at right now are about the, the maximum that this project can sustain from affordability component to still keep the non-affordable rents as low as possible. So you can imagine, you know, also if we added more affordable components, then we're having to raise the rents on the non-affordable ones to astronomical levels, which is also kind of against our ethos. Um, and so there's a lot that goes into that. Tons of pro forma analysis, tons of financial work. And I hope that you can understand that, you know, it's always our goal, unfortunately, on this one. Um, it's not a possibility. Thank you. That was um, that, the, that was a good explanation. I think most of the people here tonight are um, very keen on getting this project built and um, not burdening it beyond um, uh, which to it to an extent that would prevent that. So thank you for that answer. And also thank you commissioners for your passion for providing affordable housing. Um, at this point in time, we have had proposed um, a, a couple of additional items and um, which include um, the additional uh, condition to the, I think it's called a HASON, the, the venting. Um, can we have some draft language proposed for that? Um, uh, maybe Mr. Mayor can come up with that. Um, so we could approve that tonight. Is that a, a difficult condition? Is there standard language? Um, that's that's one of my questions. And then it sounds like the um, the developer is willing to include some language to that effect. Um, I think I'll just uh, add. Um, I think it sounds like it's a pretty specific request, and uh, I'd actually maybe perhaps ask that Commissioner Gordon has uh, draft language that she'd like to um, suggest. Uh, we'd be happy to um, take that and, and, you know, make sure that the spirit of the condition is, uh, is included in the condition itself. Um, Commissioner Gordon, you have Okay. That's a big one for my very first commission meeting. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, well, ultimately, hey, Tim, it's Pete. I, I remember the one from the uh, Front Street project pretty well. Right. This isn't it. the first time it's come in front of Jump in. <laughs> I'd be happy to throw out yeah. some words. Um, yeah. the, the commercial space shall be designed with a chase so as to accommodate future restaurant or cafe use, something like that. That, that sounds like, like the intent. Um, yeah. Sam, did you have a comment on that? Do you have some words available? I'd like to make sure we have the uh, condition, the language of the condition as close as possible so we can act tonight. Yeah, that. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Conway. That That is a pretty standard condition that we typically apply to these types of projects with commercial spaces. So thank you for bringing that up, Commissioner Gordon. Um, mm -hmm. We do have some standard language. I'm looking it up now. And then um, if you give me one second, then I'll, I can read that into the record. Okay, great, thank you. Thank um, you. Um, and I am, um, um, assuming that we don't have any, do we have any commissioners objecting to adding that language? Um, I have not seen a sign of that. So we'll just proceed with having that ready for a motion. Um, also, um, Commissioner Kennedy, you're on the hook for changing the number of charge of uh, chargers. Is there, do you want to propose language for that? And it sounds like mm -hmm. kind of 
You're a little bit wiggly, but. Um... If EV has installed EV chargers, this is like right out of the world, um, to provide a 20% instead of 12%. Okay. So let me try that again. Instead, I installed a EV parking for the residential. The project show install nine stalls and install future. First of all, Tess, did you get those words? No, not at all. But what I did get from the um, design team was that they agreed to uh, install 11 instead of nine, which I think that staff can probably just put those numbers into the existing language. So long as it's clear with everybody that they said 11 instead of nine. Let staff make those changes. Hey, that sounds okay. That's fine with me, Tess. Okay. Good, thank you. Um, and then uh, let's see. Um, did uh, Commissioner Maxwell, did you want to uh, make a motion about requiring additional units, additional affordable units? Yeah, so what I'd like to do at this point is to make a motion to approve the staff recommendations with the additional um, added language by the two, um, the Chase language as well as the EV language, as well as to include that the um, applicant provide two additional affordable units. I'll go ahead and second that motion. Okay, um, we have a motion on the floor. Um, I think that we have agreement on the, um, the other modifications to the staff recommendation. I'm gonna suggest that we have a vote on the um, adding two additional affordable units um, and handle that matter separately. Can I have a, um, so I'm, I'm going to treat that as a separate motion. And we, I think we have a motion on the floor and a second. I think just point of order, I think someone would have to motion. I was just, the just motion thinking. and then we would have to vote on that. And then you could vote it that way. Yeah, I think that, I think that you're right about that. Um, can I, is there someone willing to make a motion um, to that effect Commissioner Polhamus? Yeah, I would just make a motion to separate the affordability motion from the EV and Chase motion. Um, is there is there a second for that motion? Well, I like where where we're going. But I think we should have a roll call vote on Commissioner Maxwell's motion as is, and then we could potentially have another motion against the project. Mm. Yeah, I'm getting that right. We've had yeah, motions override, motion other motions right? on the floor yeah, before. Yeah, your motion, John. I am. You got you to gotta get the split motion, vote right. for the split motion, That's and right. then you can vote separately on the two things. So uh, you were headed that direction, and then you got a little sidetrack. A little sidestep, <laughs> yeah. Okay, so we have a uh, motion on the floor to split the, um, the motion to the staff recommendation with the two changes and separately vote on the um, requiring two additional affordable units. And we have a, a motion, do we have a second on treating it separately? I'll second. Thank you. Um, could we have a roll call vote test on separating these actions? Commissioner um, Dawson. No. Gordon. Yes. Kennedy. Yes. C.D. Miller. Yes. Maxwell. No. Paul Hamas. Aye. You missed me. One way. Yes. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, with that, um, treating these separately, 
Um, I think I do need a motion to, or do I need a motion? It's already been, it's already been um, included. Do I, have a, do I have a motion to require the project to include two additional deed restricted affordable units? Just for clarity, could I get that motion? That, that motion's already on the floor and it was seconded. I wasn't, and I wasn't, I wasn't sure if it was on the floor with, with all of that. Okay, so it's on the floor. And um, does anybody want to speak further to that motion? No? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, go ahead, Sean. I mean, I'll keep saying this is just a basic 15%. This is like the minimum, minimum that we should require for any development. Um, you know, it's 20% inclusionary. And because of the base density issue, we've run into this over and over again. I don't, and I, I want to acknowledge the, you know, the unaffordable, the, the possibility that it won't pencil out, but we could make some changes somewhere to, we're, we're asking two out of 105 extra units not asking a lot so i just want to say that like this isn't a 12 unit project and we're asking for two extra this is a 105 unit project and we're asking for two extra we definitely need more than that but that's all we're asking thank you commissioner dawson yeah i i, I just want to again you know we have to be uh looking at what other municipal the municipalities are doing that are in the highly desirable areas with you know extreme housing costs and one of the ways that they they do that this all in the kitchen sink approach is by inclusionary and again 20 percent inclusionary is on our book and the laws have changed since that happened and in order to keep up with the laws um you know I, we need to be um holding developers accountable as we can. And I just want to also be clear, not pencil out um, means less profit for the developer. So we, we need to just be clear about the language that we're talking about. I think this developer has gone above and beyond to try to address the neighborhood concerns, but we are in a housing affordability crisis and we, we don't have a lot of space left in Santa Cruz. So every time we put up one of these huge developments and 80, you know, 85, 87% of that development is not affordable, um, we, we can't get that back. And I, I just feel like we're in an emergency and, and we have to act accordingly. Thank you. Commissioner Kennedy. So I just wanted to respond briefly. I do appreciate everyone here's content of, of doing more affordable housing. I do not agree that further burdening market rate projects is the way to do that. And I'm thinking of 831 water right there. That was two buildings with a big affordable building. So I just think these market rate projects need to be helped out with a minimum of cost. You know, we should stick with what's on the books. I know some people disagree with state law. I don't, I think it's fine, but that's just my personal opinion. And not to take it too far, but downtown is the perfect example. We're in a big market rate apartments, and then the next buildings down the way are 100 percent affordable. I think personally that's more effective, and you can see the evidence downtown right in front of you, rather than just like taking it out of it. It's market rate project. So that's my response. I am, am in favor of affordable housing, not at the cost of raising market rate rents. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, I appreciate all the comments on this, and I would just like to say that I think that these developers have shown um, a great deal of integrity. I know I've poured over those um, spreadsheets with analysis of um, what a project can do. And um, I uh, really would, would caution us to not um, burden a project and keep it from being built. We've um, approved a number of really nice projects that never have been built. So anyway, um, with that, I think, oh, one more comment, uh, Samantha. Thank you, Commissioner Conway. I just want to read into the record this condition for um, creating food service areas for the record, if you like. Right there. Thank you. Okay, let me know. Hold that, uh, we bifurcated this vote. Great, and okay. We'll back to you in just a second. Um, so Tess, could you call the roll, uh, please, on the motion to 
require two additional affordable units. Commissioner Dawson? Yes. Gordon? No. Kennedy? No. Maxwell? Yeah. C.D. Miller? No. Paul Hamus? No. Conway? No. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, now for the rest of the motion on the floor, um, uh, Sam, could you read the language? Yes, so the condition would read, all commercial spaces shall be constructed to support a future food service use. Plans must include ducting and venting plans for all commercial spaces. All ducting and venting should be designed to be hidden or incorporated into the building design. Plans shall also show the locations of grease traps, grease lines, and grease storage facilities. Um, and that's sort of our standard condition for these types of projects. And it looks like Commissioner Gordon is satisfied. And yeah. <laughs> it does sound like um, uh, that is the standard language that I've seen. And I'm going to assume that the development team, if they don't object, is also, also is fine with the language. We're fine with the language. That's great. Thank you. So with that, we have a motion and a second on the floor to um, approve the staff recommendation as amended. Test. Do you have any, would you like any clarification about exactly what it is we are voting on? And then no, we'll that's see perfectly it. clear. You're voting on the main, uh, the staff recommendation with the addition of those two condition, conditions of approval. Okay, great. Thank you. Do any commissioners have any comments? Uh, Commissioner Dawson, I see your hand up. That's old. Yeah. I just wanted to circle back um, on the cumulative traffic impacts and the fact that I do think, um, although I'd like to see more affordability, obviously that we're not going in that direction, but I do have real pause supporting this project with the traffic impacts and the way that we are in the city currently, um, you know, we're not, the, the traffic memo to me is not transparent enough and clear enough about why certain multipliers were used versus others. And I see nowhere in the document where we're looking at the cumulative traffic impacts of these two large projects outside the downtown area on this corridor. As everyone's pointed out, this is a way a lot of people get from one side of the city to the other. And if, if, if we're moving forward with projects that, and we don't have a true holistic picture of the traffic impacts so we can mitigate them in the best way possible, I think, you know, it, it's, it's going to be something that we pay for for a long, long time. And so um, I have real issue with the traffic study, and I just wanted to put that into the record. Um, and I'm going to um, not be supporting moving this forward. I would prefer to continue it so that we could get our ducks in a row and make sure that we're totally in line with the CEQA categorical exemption. Oh, my God. Okay. Um, uh, okay, are there any com other commissioners that want to comment on the motion on the floor, which is to approve the staff, re staff recommendation as amended? Uh, Commissioner Maxwell. Yes, um, again, obviously, affordability is number one on my plate, obviously, uh, after tonight and before then even. Uh, I definitely want to concur with Commissioner Dawson that I think as someone who has driven there, there's so much going on. There's so much going to go on there in the, as far as traffic goes, let alone parking. I mean, I, I would like to have seen a little bit more work done and to really have seen how we're really going to mitigate the, the traffic impact. So I also will not be supporting this motion based off of that. Okay, thank you. Any other commissioners have a comment before we vote on the motion on the floor? With that, Tess, could you call the roll call vote? Commissioner Dawson? No. Gordon? Yes. Kennedy? Yes. Maxwell? No. C.D. Miller? Yes. Mohamas? Yes. Conway? Yes. 
with that, the motion passes. Um, again, thank you, everybody, neighbors, developers, um, interested members of the community. We really appreciate your attention um, to this matter. And um, with that, we'll, we'll move on. Um, are there any information items tonight? Yes. Thanks, Commissioner Conway. You know, I don't know how to get that little yellow hand up, so I always just have to put my hand up. So sorry about that. <laughs> Almost obsolete info, so never mind. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, I do have a couple announcements. Just wanted to let you know what's coming up. Um, we have, um, well, first, I wanted to give you an update on 126 eucalyptus. Um, that project was heard by the California Coastal Commission. It was appealed to the Coastal Commission by a neighbor. And um, the Coastal Commission found that there was no substantial issue. So it never it went on to a full hearing before the Coastal Commission. Um, basically, they ruled against the appeal and upheld the approval. Um, but the neighbor has um, also filed a sequel lawsuit with the city um, for the project as well. So we'll be working on that. Um, and then February 23rd, that's next week, we have the Downtown Library Affordable Housing Project. Um, that started out as a, a project that only required approval by the Planning Commission, but it has been called up by the City Council. So the Planning Commission will be hearing that item and making a recommendation to the City Council on that project. Um, and then on March 2nd, that's our first in-person meeting um, we've got 530 Front Street. That's an eight-story mixed-use building um, that has 276 apartments above ground floor commercial. That's at the corner of Front Street and Soquel. Um, so it's one of those riverfront projects where they're going to be filling the levee and providing some um, uh, outdoor space on the river walk. Um, we also have the rail trail segments eight and nine that will be on March 2nd. And... Um, we had planned to bring the a parking ordinance, which was essentially an ordinance that would codify AB 2097, um, but we realized we're not entirely ready for that to be heard yet. And so we will be requesting a formal continuance at the March 2nd meeting. And I think that's it. Got a lot coming up. Yes, we certainly do. Thank you for that. Um, and I don't believe we have any subcommittee or advisory bodies um, oh, convened. Right now. Oh. I just had a quick question for Sam. Sorry, sorry, oh. Commissioner Conway. Go right um, ahead. Um, Sam, uh, when could the um, when do we think the materials are going to be posted um, for the special meeting? I've just had a lot of members of the public ask when they think the agenda items and all that is going to be up. So I just um, was wondering if you had a timeline for that. Um, Tess would be a good resource for that. We would submit them on Friday. Tess, do you have them posted on Friday? Yes, my goal is always to post materials um, by 4 o'clock the Friday before the Thursday, the following Thursday meeting. So barring okay. any kind of major issue on my part, you should see it prior to 4 o'clock tomorrow. Okay. Thanks so much for, I, it was just good to get that out to the public. Thanks. I appreciate that. And Commissioner Maxwell. Yeah, thank you. Um, I just, I was going to wait till items referred to future agendas because I didn't know where to put this uh, request, but it's to staff um, regarding uh, agenda items and really regarding um, correspondence, public correspondence. I know that you guys do your best to get it to us as soon as possible. Um, like for people that work, I mean, we work all, I work most of the week. And so coming to get ready for a commission meeting and seeing 34 pages of public correspondence posted an hour or two before, or maybe three hours before a, a meeting, is really daunting if I'm trying to do my job correctly. And I know you guys would do your best, but um, I know that all those, that correspondence that we got today was all from September and August of last year. So I would just make it 
if, if you could like give us as much correspondence as, as it comes in. I know I'm asking you to do more than you already do, but it makes my time a little easier to try and like sift through everything and still be prepared for the meeting. So I, I would love that. I wanted to, since you brought that up, um, this is the clerk. Uh, generally, when uh, we release it on Friday, um, members of the public uh, receive the packet right before you do. Then you get it. The channels are open for them to email us. Sometimes we get letters, not so much anymore. I try not to send you guys a ton of stuff. If, if it's a big item and we get a lot of correspondence, I usually try to collect everything from whatever we got over the weekend and give it to you like on a Monday. And then if there's a whole bunch more, I usually try and give it to you by noon on Wednesday just because I don't want to send you a whole bunch of emails and have you miss something. Would you prefer that I – that other correspondence was something different, but in terms of I anticipate this next meeting, we'll probably get a lot of correspondence. That's what I'm anticipating. So is it sufficient if I provide everything I have? Up? The public pretty much has until – noon on the day before the meeting to guarantee that their um, correspondence will be considered by the the planning commission and after that time i send it off to you guys did, did yes, you want me to back that up this time i think what happened this time is what, there's usually a link to any correspondence that has come up and i think that just wasn't included this time so we got it in kind of hurry typically it is included though and that that's is exactly right. Yeah, we but things were done a little differently with this one, and I think it was just a, an error. But um, we we would usually provide all of the correspondence that we have received to date at the time, you know, as an as an attachment to your staff reports. So you'd be able to sift through that, and then just prior to the meeting, like Tess is saying, we will provide you with anything else that we've received between the staff report being posted and the and the hearing date. So I, I apologize for that. And I do, um, I hear you, Commissioner Maxwell, and I'm sorry about um, providing all that correspondence last minute. Hey, it's Pete. I just want to point out the holiday on Monday. So it's going to be extra tight next week in particular. Hey, thanks for reminding us of that. You'll have plenty to read on Tuesday. <laughs> Okay, and I think with that, we don't have, uh, that was a uh, useful item to bring up. Thank you, Commissioner Maxwell. Um, and, uh, but with that, uh, we will adjourn tonight's meeting. Thank you all very much. We'll see Thanks, you. Julie, you did a great job. Thank you.